And so this is such an incredible service this morning. This morning. We have the Reinekes here, but I'm going to ask the whole Reineke family to come and stand here with me. Catherine, you can join me as well. Um, where is Marines? Where is... What's my name, Genoet? Is, is Marines in the house? Not this Marines, the other Marines? I think he's with the kids' church. Uh, he came to me this morning. I just want to say, Marines, he ran to me and says, Wilma, I missed you so much. And he hugged me, and I'm like, hey, I don't know a lot of other Marineses. And so I hugged him back and cried. And um, so, yes. This is for us such an incredible full circle moment. Three years back, three years back, God did something in, in Enos Park. I said I was not going to cry. So when I saw Ansi just now, I think I burst out in tears. Um, there's uh, this thing that happened. Um, Ansi phoned me once, um, or I phoned him, and I said, I'm so confused. Uh, it was in the January of 2020. I phoned him, and I was like, I'm confused. I don't know where I should be. Uh, and in the typical way of Ansi Reineke, I just want to say that he said this. Hey, is there sin? I said, no. He says, um, do you love your wife? I say, yes. He says, then there's no other thing. God's purpose is on you. Um, hear his voice and follow his voice. And just like that, I'm like, okay. I submitted. And, I'm sorry, and, and then something happened in that year uh, where God has placed... Uh, such a great task for this family ahead to plant in Zagreb. Uh, and that happened quickly. I don't know if you remember, uh, but there was an announcement and then it was COVID. And then, that's not, that was not, I don't want to say, a lot of things are on them, but that one was not, know, I'm just kidding. Um, so this morning, I, if you don't know, um, the Nanika family headed up the Enos Park Church um, before me and Catherine came uh, along. But there has been such a great um, um, call of God on their lives for Europe. Um, and here they are today for the first time in three years, for me, three years. Um, but, um, but we are not only welcoming them back, they are family. Um, if you look at them, you look at me. Um, uh, they were here before I was. And so um, we want to welcome, can we give them such a lovely round of applause? Come on. I just want to snipe the rumors that we are swapping. Um, uh, they're coming back and we're going to Zagreb. That is not the case. Okay. Okay, good. So I'm gr not great with languages. Um, the first time I spoke, uh, I had to preach at Enops. Um, th they all know I can speak English, but they definitely knew I cannot preach in English. Um, but luckily, God uh, has grace for us. So this morning, uh, for Marines as well, uh, but for this family, we... I uh, want to do a special prayer. I want you to stretch out your hands, and Hans is going to give us the word this morning from God, but let us just pray over them. Let's love over them, and let's bless them. Um, can I ask the elders, if you're an elder, please come to the front. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jan. Um, Heinrich, you can come. Yeah, let's come around them. Thank you, Catherine. I did not bring my anointing oil. Uh, does someone have oil here? Thank you, Debbie. I knew it. I just want to bless them. Come on. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, let's stretch out our hands. Can we do a standing prayer? Can I ask that? Let's stand together. Lord, we come this morning um, not because we uh, are honoring um, the man of God. But we are honoring a family that has been called by God. Father God, I come this morning and I bless them. And I anoint their heads, their spirits, their hearts, everything they've been through, Marines as well. And their hands for the ministry that you've called them to. For the time that they've been spending, um, just getting to know the language of that country, getting into the culture of it. Um, I pray this morning, Father God, that, that nothing has changed, but a lot has been added. I see a picture in your family, it's like a family photo, that God has placed so many things in the Spirit around you, over you, in front of you, under you, in protection, in preparation, and also in the, in the, in the run of things, God has 
taken away things from this family that was not supposed to be there anymore. God has placed a new anointing on you. Um, there is going to be a season where leaders will come um, and you will show them away, but there will be f- a few coming and there will be ig- ignition in their hearts of what you are doing. There will be a leadership and a fathership standing up um, regarding where you are at in Zagreb and people will follow just naturally. God says um, there is a river, a, sh- a shift in the movement in the river. He's taking you out of one river and placing you in another. As a family, God is saying, you can, you can lie on your backs. You can let this, that stream, uh, let me take you to where I want you to be. And this morning, Father God, just as a family, we will bless them with every blessing on, in heaven. I pray for everything that they, not only in their physical needs, Father God, but spiritually uh, and in their future and for the next generation and the next generation to come out of this family, Father God. I pray this morning that um, your word is true over them, over and over, and almost like a wave coming in sevens. God is saying there is a wave, a third wave coming um, in this seven waves that, that you're going to enjoy a lot. Uh, and God says, wait for the wave. It's not going to crush you. Uh, it's not going to come over you. It's my love. Um, it's the next phase that God is taking you in. And God is preparing for f- you for big things. And thank you, Lord, that we can just come around them, not only in protection, but in family love, in the name of Jesus. And everyone says, amen and amen. Thank you. Good morning, church. Now, on that light note, I just want to say it's such a privilege for me to be here. Uh, Okay, just quickly stand up and let's shake that off. (laughs) Do Do you feel like me? Like, yeah, so it's so good to be here and to see everybody. Uh, If my English is poor, we've been learning a new language. Okay, so something's got to give. And I think it was the English. So, uh, but... 
Nonetheless, it's really such a privilege for us to be here. Thank you, Marines. Um, for you as leadership, it's just um, incredible to think that we were here. We dreamed of planting a church. The Lord graced us by Him planting the church and us participating in it. And since day one, I, I told Yaku, all of our, I said, Yaku, listen, this church is a church for the nation. So either I'm going to stay and you go, or you're going to stay and I'm going to go. So we didn't know which one it is. So in the end, Jaco took too long, so we left. Um, but nonetheless, just to see that here you are, and here the Lord is still working in our midst. Isn't that amazing? Well, I think it's amazing. So just quickly, I want to open up the notes. So just to give you some brief background of where we're at, we're in the United States of Croatia. It's not really United States, but um, we're staying in the capital city called Zagreb. Zagreb, okay, everybody say Zagreb. Great stuff. Now, whom of you have been in Croatia? <laughs> what? <laughs> okay, so for the other four of you, welcome. I'm glad that you went there, Abigail. I'm so glad you were there. Um, so we're staying in Zagreb, the capital city, and um, so we've been there for about two and a half years now. We went in the middle of COVID. There was literally a 24-hour window opportunity. There was about 50 people at the airport. They had to phone Croatia by hand to say, these are the papers. Do you accept them? Are they in the system? Yes. All systems go, whoops, there we went. Uh, starting point of the most incredible, most difficult thing in my life. <laughs> But man, it was amazing. So where we're at is uh, Proverbs 20 verse 4 captures it. It says, I don't want to lie to you. It says, the sluggard plows nothing in autumn, but he will seek at harvest and find nothing. So the, the sluggard plows nothing. He just does nothing. But then when the harvest comes, he will have nothing. And that's where we realize that if we want a harvest, and before we go for the harvest, we have to plow. So we're plowing. Part of plowing is learning the language. Part of plowing is building friendships. It's learning about the culture. It's day and night difference. Now, those of you who have been uh, tourists will say, everybody speaks English. Everybody's so friendly. Everybody's amazing. Yes, that's tourist zones uh, or expat zones. Move into the neighborhood. And then you go, it's like, govoritele engleski. Nah. Okay, that means, do you speak English? And it's a profound no. So that's why we're building the culture and breaking through. And just to give you a snapshot, if you go into a different nation like that, uh, my mentor told me a very good advice. He said, Hansi, before you go into the nation, just know it's like putting a sock in your mouth and then blindfolding yourself and then putting earplugs in your ears and then putting a weight back, a very heavy weighted bag on your back, and then you tie your feet together and then you go into the nation and then you go and make a living. And I couldn't understand why he said that, it's, and it's, it, he was absolutely right. Why? Because you can't speak, they don't understand you. You can't hear because you don't understand a word they're saying. And then you don't know where you need to go. It is weighted because you feel the, the pressure of the situation of what you're going into. But what we did not know, going into that nation, that was actually the way that God opened our eyes. We realized that we got desensitized over time. Being in South Africa, realizing the beautiful cultures that we have, the life, the relationships, and we got lost in it. We never even saw it. Going into a new nation and suddenly God opens our hearts. He gives us a humility because we realize that, hey, it's not about you. <laughs> so it was the best thing that could have happened to us. But can I be, be frank and say, if there's somebody that I'm proud of, it's my family. Man, my wife and my children... <laughs> They are the heroes. I'm telling you how they're reaching out, building relationships, pressing through. They, by the way, Abigail and Marina speaks fluent Croatian. Even the Croats can't even notice the difference in their dialect or their, their pronunciation. They are impressed by it. Sometimes we know some missionaries, they are there for over six years, and their kids can't speak Croatian. So that's the grace of God. You can give them a hand, okay? So we're plowing, and we're breaking ground, and we're building great relationships. We're seeing beautiful things happen, uh, but we're taking the long route because we're not reaching out to internationals. Uh, at first, we're not reaching out to the English-speaking. We are building relationships with Croats. 
And that's why we're speaking the language. That's why we're breaking through, because we need to reach them. Because if we reach the Croats, we will be able to reach down into the Balkans because they speak the same language in different other nations as well. So we have a great heart for that, that part of the world. Come and visit us, not in our apartment, because apartment living is very small, leaving the house. Thanks, Jake, for looking after our house. It's your house now. Okay. So today we're going to talk about messy church. And that, just as the video, this is also an exciting topic. It's drawing the line of sin, with sin. Okay, so we're drawing the line with sin. So they gave me a great topic to preach on as a visiting pastor. So um, I hope that you can enjoy this service. So we're going to start and we're quickly going to read chapter 5 of the first book of Corinthians. Are you guys with me? It is actually reported, Paul says, that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans. For a man has his father's wife. This is his stepmother. And you are arrogant. Whew. Paul had, had a moment with him. Loving, isn't it? Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. For though absent in body, I am present in spirit. And as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus... You are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the whole leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy and the swindlers or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of this world. No, now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed. Or isn't an idolater, a reviler, drunkard, or swindler? Not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. Thank you. This is a hard word. Now, may the Lord grace me to bring perspective in this hard word. Can you see that he is drawing a very hard line? He's saying, do not even eat with such a person. We're all going to eat alone. Nobody will be able to eat with someone. Why? Because we can see in this situation that he is drawing a hard line. And this is the first letter, but it's actually not the first letter. He wrote one earlier, and then he had to write this one in response now, we don't know where the first letter is, but you can see that there is a response. And he's saying, no, no, no. He, he spoke to them about the sin in the church, and then they replied with a softer reply, and then he realized, okay, let's send another letter. They did not get the message. And this time he was like, it's like, don't make me come down there. And that's why we had this speech. So, but to come down and to tell the guys, listen, you have to deal with a sinful person. You have to purge him, cast him out to Satan. Why would he say such a hard, harsh thing? Why was it so, so strict? Now, if we, if we need the answer for that, you have to go back and look at the culture. So Corinth, if you look at the picture, is can you see Greece um, in the middle and then Athens on top of it? Can you guys see it? If you see it, say, uh-huh. Thank you. So between Athens and Greece, it's also part of Greece, but Athens is the, uh, the capital. You will see that there was a line that, uh, and a, a, a harbor that cut through that part of Greece. So in that, it connected the Indian Ocean, or Indian Sea, the Adriatic, and the Aegean Sea with one another. And then the, for people coming from the south up north, from people to the east, from, the, from that side to the west, it connected the world from north to south to east to west. So this was a huge opportunity. This brought so much economy. 
so much business. This was a massive, massive city. Now, with the world coming in to find their riches, it also brought their problems. Why? Because among the problems, the sailors that had to come through this area or from different parts were sailors. They were sailors that were on the sea for several months and now suddenly at bay, and they had needs to be met. And some of those needs were sexual needs. So what happened is this was a hub and economy of sex. So there was prostitution. And then what, just to make matters a little bit lighter, what also happened is they also had the pagan beliefs that filled into it because they had the temple, I never get this word right, the temple for the worship of Aphrodite, which was the goddess of sex or the goddess of, of prostitution. So by going into the temple, you were participating in rituals and this was not involving prayer. So it was a dark city. But now what also happened is there was highways built from different parts to and from Corinth, so to bring the people into the city and also from the city out. Massive opportunity. But what also happened is in this midst of this incredible culture, they also had postmodernistic elements. Okay, so I'm going to unpack that a little bit so that you can understand what I mean. By, by what happened is Corinth not only drew businessmen, but they drew the best philosophers, and the best speakers of that time. So what happened is the people of Corinth would follow the best speakers, the best philosophers. So in this matter, truth was not about what was right. It was who had the best speech. So because of that, they would follow them. Now, as I was reading this, I realized that that's the same in our midst. I mean, how many people have their favorite pastor, but they hardly ever read a chapter in the Bible? Or we follow YouTube links, and we listen to what people are saying, but we don't even know what's the truth underneath it. We hardly ever check it. So the same elements that we could see there, you can look at Gauteng, which is also a hub for economy of sex and economy of corruption. We're in the same position. Now what also happened, they were so proud of their pluralistic view of life. Now pluralistic means that there is, you believe that there are more, more than one ways of truth or ways of life. So for them, it was, to talk about pluralism, it's where somebody, somebody, sometimes, somebody would say, okay, let's take a look at this piano. No, it's a piano. Piano. Everybody say piano. Everybody say piano. But I really believe this is a piano. It's a piano. But listen, my motive is really pure. I really, really, really believe that this is a piano. And I want this to be a piano. Please believe with me that this is a piano. Would you believe with me this is a piano? Would you? No? Okay, so it's a piano. You just have to get used to it. Why? Because I believe it is a piano. So what happens is the emotions and the way of life, what you think is right, became the way of life. So people would come in and say, this is what I really believe is true. And because I believe it with a sincere heart, it has to be true. That's pluralism. How many people are stuck in relationships many times, even in our world today, they are struggling maybe with, with sin not maybe, they are struggling with sin and they can't break through. And then because they struggle long enough, they really believe that they want to be free and they want to be new. And this is really true for them because they really believe it, then it must be true. So we see pluralism even in our day. But then there's something that was incredible. They lived very pragmatic lives. So there was a rule of life for the, for the people of Corinth. And that is, if it works it must be right. They must have driven BMW or something. I don't know. But if it works, it's right. So, for instance, yes, we know the envelope under the table. We have like five different ways of talking about corruption in Croatia. You talk about solarni plache, which means you pay it in the sun between one another. It's like ispot uh, stola. 
to pay under the table. There are so many ways. I'm not going to waste your time on learning. Why? Because there's a lot of opportunities for this. Okay, so let's take, for instance, you believe if it's right, then uh, if, it's, if it works, then it's right. Many times people would say that, yes, I know uh, envelope under the table is not right, but I keep getting opportunities, and the Lord has not convicted me, so I really believe that then when it works, it must be right. Or people would say that, yes, I know that marriage is a covenant and it's a commitment, but it's not working because my wife and I are constantly fighting and struggling, so then it means it's not right. Maybe it's then the end of our marriage. Or maybe you have friendships with people and you're so close to them until you have that fight and it's like, oh, it's not long, no longer working. Okay, maybe it's not right. We are living pluralistic lives just like they did. But what happened to truth? I know we had a fight, but the word tells me to go and make right. So what they lost was truth. So in this whole situation, talking about Corinth, we can relate with this church because we see it in our midst. I see it in my own heart. <laughs> you see it in your heart. But the amazing thing is, in all of this, you will have to go and search far and wide to get a church that had more problems than the church of Corinth. But Paul said, <laughs> this is a church where they do not lack any spiritual gift. This is a church where Paul stuck with, and he kept walking with him. He had a bigger rebuke for the church of Galatians that did not have these issues. They only had religious sin. Only. When he wrote the book of Galatians, he was saying, yes, this is Paul, uh, apostle from the Lord Jesus. You foolish Galatians. He was going for it. And this one, he gives an introduction. He's like pampering them. Why? Because he knew God was working in this messy church. So that's the good news. Despite our challenges and our struggles, God is working. Now, it's a messy church. But it's still God's church. So in this chapter, um, Paul speaks and he says, listen guys, uh, remember he says in verse 6 to 8, Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven. I always struggle with the word leaven. Is it leaven or leaven? Leaven, like eleven. Okay. That you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. So he's talking about the concept of leaven or leaven. Can we say leaven for today? Thank you. Leaven. Twelve, yes. He's talking about the twelve. So in this context, he's pointing and he's saying, listen, and get rid of the old leaven that is among you. Purge yourselves. Become holy. So they understood very well what Paul meant. Why? Because it was a custom that was repeated every year. It started at the Passover when they were exited out of Exodus, and they had the first Passover. The Lord brought in this custom to say, you are going to prepare yourselves in this feast of unleavened bread to remove all leaven from your house so that there will be no leaven in your house as a symbol to say that you have to purify your hearts. No leaven in your house. And it was so strong that he would even say that the word would say that if they found somebody that it ate leaven during that time or they participated or it was in the house, they can be cut off from Israel. He was serious about it. Why? Because he wanted to bring across the point that there should be no sin in the house. But it was a preparation for the Passover that was coming. So in this context, people knew when Paul spoke about leaven, he knew that he was talking about sin. And they knew that it meant that they had to be purged. They had to be purified. And they knew that there was sin among them. They knew about this guy because it was the second letter. And this time there was no uh, punches hold, held back. So he was really going strong at this situation. And everybody was guilty. And the fellowship was influenced. And he said, cleanse out the, uh, the old leaven that you may be a new lump. As you 
really are unleavened. Now, this is very important. He's reminding them that they should remove the leaven from their midst. But then he brings in something different. He says, because you really are already unleavened. Why would he say that? This is a church struggling. You see, the key lies in the next verse. It says, for Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. So he's talking to the church and he's challenging them to live holy lives, to purge the sin that's in their midst. Why? Not like in the past where they had to do the, the feast of unleavened bread to purify the house because then the Passover will take place. No, it's because the Passover already took place. And because of the price that was paid on the cross, and because we accepted, He purified us, He made us holy, and because of that, we are already unleavened. And because of the work that He has done, it is not on your shoulders to live holy. It is on His shoulders, He made you holy through the cross, and now you start walking in what you already are. He broke the penalty of sin over your lives, and now what's happening is He is helping you to walk in the, uh, in the victory of the cross so that the power of sin will lose its power over your lives. Purge the leaven among you because you are already unleavened. You see, the thing is, the Passover lamb was sacrificed. They knew what happened is, they, they first had the unleavened process and then they, the last day, they had to take the blood of the lamb and post it on the doorposts and because of the blood on the doorpost, the angel would walk by and they would not be struck with death. That was the reason, but they first had to purify themselves. So then that same night, after the angel walked past and their lives were spared, they were also supposed to eat the lamb. I'm so grateful for that part. <laughs> okay, lamb is very expensive in Croatia. So... Uh, <laughs> Enjoy your lamb. Here's the thing. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. What happened when the blood was spilled and the angel walked past and their lives were spared, it's not because they were sinless. It's because the lamb was holy. And he took the punishment upon himself. And because of the work that he has done, you can walk in victory. What happened with this Passover, it was the introduction of a new era. He said in Exodus that from this day on, this will be the new month for you. This will be the new year. So they started with this custom, walking into the new year. Now the funny thing, I'll add something to this. It's no longer the beginning of the year for the Jewish calendar because after exile, they were taken into captivity and they have lost their old calendar. Can you see the effect of sin in the world? Okay, but it was the, production, the, the introduction of a new era. He's saying a new thing is coming. So when you accept that the blood that was slain, it's the new date. It's a new life that starts. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. I mean, a new creation. And the old is gone and the new has come. It also meant there was a substitution because the lamb was slain so that the people will be spared. He substituted positions, and you and I know that. But He did not just cover your sin. He gave you a new life. It was also the process of judgment and salvation. Jesus did not just pardon sin. He became sin. And He fulfilled the penalty of sin. Because He's a righteous and a just God. And because of that, there is a celebration. So it's not just that Jesus gave us a victory. It's that just like they saw the blood of the lamb on the doorpost, they could eat and feast on the lamb. It's a fulfillment. It's a, a nourishment that we have in him. It's not just that he covers your sin and says, okay, now you go and you live. Try to live holy. Now because of this, he says, therefore, cleanse out the old leaven. Cleanse it. 
Get rid of it. In other words, speak the truth. Act. Respond. Speak the truth in love to one another. Now, this is where it gets interesting. He says, is it not those inside the church whom we are to judge? Why he's saying that is, if you want to judge the world because of their sin, you're going to have to leave the world because there is sin all around us. Now, please don't judge a sinner with the rules and the law of Christianity because you even can't fulfill it without the grace of God. What you do is you walk them to Christ, to Christ so that they can experience the finished work of the cross and become born again and receive the Spirit of God. And now He walks by His grace to live holy lives. Do not, do not impose your laws on unbelievers. So He's talking, He says, are you not supposed to judge those in the church? Whoo, judgment. Ooh. Don't judge. I was in a store one one Sunday, and there was a girl with tattoo, massive tattoo on her arm. Only God can judge me. And she was really friendly. She gave me great service. And I said, oh, it's such a pity. I, I really wanted to give you a compliment, but I can't. She's like, why? I said, because you say, said just now that only God can judge you. No, 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 that's not what I mean. I said, no, if I give you a compliment on your great service, I'm judging you. I'm judging your character and your service, so I can't judge you because you're not allowing me, because only God can judge you. You see, and that's how we look at it, because we have this concept of judgment that is so dark, and people judge your actions and your motives and everything, but we're missing something. We have to judge. When you open that chicken breast that you want to cook for dinner, I make a really mean Thai green curry that I learned when I was in, well, in Croatia. But when you open that chicken breast, and it speaks back to you, and it's like, whoo, you just judged the chicken, you judger. <laughs> so when somebody borrowed your car, and they drove into the pole, and you say, you stole my car, and you drove into the pole, this was bad driving, you're judging, and you have to judge. When you sit with someone, you're in sexual sin. You are judging, and you're judging rightly. Where we come into sin is where you say, and therefore you are such a lousy person because you never can learn to drive, and you always think of yourself. Now you're judging motives, and now you're in the area of God, and now you're sinning. Now the thing is, he is challenging us. He says, you have to judge. It's important but here's the difference. It's not that I come to Francois and say, Francois, you better get your life ready. This is the end of it. I'm telling you now, you better stand up and live up to the standard that I'm living. <laughs> no. It is coming alongside him. Let's talk about your issues. Can I talk about mine? Not now, okay? It's going to take a long time. <laughs> and I'm coming alongside him. Why? Because I know I'm in the same boat. But by the grace of God, I can come alongside Him and I can walk with Him into victory. I just judged. Even from Corinthians, the church's wheels kept falling off. But thank God that He keeps the, walls, the wheels going. This is His church. And if we will love one another and speak the truth into love, in, in love to one another, we will see people walk in victory. We will see people walk in freedom. We will see marriages healthy. We will see friendship restored. And they will work through their struggles. Now, see what happened just going to say this quickly. On the one side, the church started telling the world how they are supposed to live. Like we had the scapegoat. You know what a scapegoat is? And there was two goats that was, the one was slain, the other one was let go. To say, because of the sin, this one is a representation that we will let him go. We will, we will, we will put all the punishment on this, on this one goat, and he will pay the punishment. So what the church did is, they have this we have the scapegoat. 
Like for a certain stage in our era, it was divorce. I don't care what you do. That's the unpardonable sin. You do not divorce. Then it became custom, and then we moved to the next one. Having children out of wedlock. Ooh. You can do whatever you do in the dark, but may they never be fruit. No children. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. Like the unpardonable sin. And then we got used to that because culture just started living as like they couldn't care. And then we moved on to homosexuality. I don't know what's next. So we have the unpardonable sin, but what we do as a church is we come alongside people, and we're not alongside, we tell people they're not supposed to do certain things. And now they are supposed to live a standard that they can't, and what happens? Their wheels fall off, and then they feel they are abandoned, they are rejected, and they cannot live up to the standard, and now they turn their back on truth. Then what the world does is because they were judged like that, what do they do? They come to the point where they say, we will determine our own truth. And now you have two schisms. And it's forcing one another in a certain direction, but we cannot come along so the, uh, uh, on, on the same page. So here's the thing. Paul mentions something. He says, though I am absent in body, I am present in spirit, and as if present... I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. He's pulling weight. Now, the best way to explain this is there was a, in um, close to Kolkata in India, there was a village and they had to make a decision on certain social responsible actions that they're going to have to take. But it was very expensive and it needed a lot of resources. And they were not sure what they're going to do. So they got all the leaders of the community together and they voted to say, should they continue with this social responsible project or not? And then everybody voted and it was resounding, no, they should not continue, they should go on to something else. And then they heard this voice in the back of the room, can we please vote again? And they voted again, it was a resounding yes, and they continued with the social responsibility project. Now you will think that's, that's one mighty <laughs> voice in the background. It was Mother Teresa. She didn't give a speech. She didn't argue. She said, can, can we vote again? The weight of her life was so convicting that people would adjust their actions and their future prediction just with one voice. Let's vote again. Oh, I heard this, and I thought, if we can do that for a human, the problem with sin is not sin. The problem with sin is our view of God. Who is He? Who is God in your life? Who is that authority that speaks that you will change and alter your life because He spoke? That you will stop sinning because He spoke? That you will adjust the direction of whatever it takes because of who he is. I'm ending with this. Um, R.A. Tory said, he used an example and he spoke about the aspect of having a mom, you know, being strict. You know, when you were student lives or maybe uh, high school lives where you were pushing the boundaries. And you are either afraid that your mom will catch out and it will break her heart and you will kill her or she will catch you out and she will kill you. you. You get, okay? So he says, there is one holier than any mother. One who is more sensitive against sin than the purest woman who ever walked this earth and who loves us even as no mother has ever loved us. This one dwells in our hearts. If we are really Christians and he sees every act we do by day or under cover of the night, he hears every words we utter in public or in private. He sees every thought we entertain. He beholds every fancy and imagination that is permitted, even a momentary lodging in our mind. And if there is anything unholy, impure, selfish, mean, petty, unkind, harsh, unjust, or any act, evil act or word or thought or fancy, 
he is grieved by it. There is one greater than Mother Teresa. There is one greater than Paul. Here's what I want to end with in this situation. There's something that bothers me about this quote. We read stuff like this in a view of God that is not who He is. We see God as a ruler. We see Him like the traffic cop that pulls you off because you broke the law and He's supposed to punish you because you did not do the right thing. But He is so gracious and so nice that He will let you go. And as long as you don't sin, you do not have this interaction with this ruler God because you're living right. And as long as you're living right, you are good. But then every time you sin and you break the law again, He will pardon you. And wow, that's amazing. You know what's the worst, the, the, the most intimate emotion that you will have towards this ruler God is gratitude. You will be grateful that He forgives you. But you will continue to try to work hard so that you don't break the law, so that you will not walk into this ruler traffic cop God again. That is not the God that we follow. He is a father. And the Bible speaks continually on several occasions of the character of God like a fountain. A fountain is only a fountain because it keeps on fountaining. The moment the water stops flowing out, it's no longer a fountain. So it's a fountain because of its flowing properties. And it constantly speaks of God as a father and as a fountain. Why? Because he cannot not flow like a father. He cannot not be a father. Even in his judgments towards you, even in your sin, even in your brokenness, he looks at you as a, like a father. He's not a traffic cop. He's a father. And Jesus comes and he prays and he says in, in John 17, he says, Father, you have loved me for eternity. What it means is that the very essence of God before you were created was to love on someone. And then he created you. And the love that was poured into His Son and the Son responding to the Father's love, you were invited into that that's already existing. And you can participate in the love between the Father and the Son. And then the Holy Spirit comes and He says, the Holy Spirit has come and He has poured and manifested the love of God in our hearts. We sin. Because we have a ruler God in our hearts. And we can't get it right. But when we taste the love of the Father, we no longer want to sin. And when we see our brother sin, we want to come alongside them. Because we know what we tasted. Father, I pray... Lord, you remind me of, of a vision that was shared with me a, a few years ago where there's a feast and it's the most amazing meal that was packed out. And there's this huge table and you're sitting on the tip of the, of the table and you're the host. And I see the people standing outside looking through the windows thinking, man, I wish I could feast. And you're waiting at an empty table because you invited us and we do not feel worthy to come in. Because we did not do the right thing or we did not do enough. Lord, help us understand who you are. Help us understand your heart. May we feast with you. church, I want to ask you. Let's feast with Him.
this feast with our Father. Lord, thank you that we can feast with you. Thank you, Lord, you, that you call us to a higher standard, not to compromise and look on our own strength and try to do this right, but to come to you and be loved and to be empowered so that we can turn our back on sin. In Jesus' name. Just want to ask you where you're at. Whatever the Lord spoke to you now, just make right with him. Just come back and say, Lord, help me open my heart to see you as a father.